Now that we've talked about enthalpy, we now need to talk about entropy. The next thing that's going to be involved in the thermodynamics of a reaction, entropy is related to the amount of disorder or sometimes randomness in a system. It turns out entropy is not exactly the same thing as disorder, although we often lie to freshmen and tell them that, uh, but they are correlated. If you have more disorder, you have more entropy. If you have more entropy, you have more disorder or more randomness again. Um, we often say more you know, frequently in, that it's related to the number of states or microstates, and there's a uh, equation involving Boltzmann's constant for that. That's not so important here for organic chemistry. Uh, that's where the idea becomes. It really comes more about you know a matter of statistics and getting more microstates than really uh, being this exact definition of disorder and stuff. But the big thing is you just correlate it with disorder or randomness. More entropy, more randomness, more disorder. So the second law of thermodynamics here is important. So in this case, it just says for a spontaneous process, the delta S of the universe is going to be positive. So for any reaction that's spontaneous, the amount of entropy in the entire universe is going to go up. Now, when we look at the delta S of a reaction, it turns out that's just the system. So when the universe is composed of the system and the surroundings. And so the system might have a delta S that's negative, but the surroundings will make up for it by having an even more positive delta S. That way the overall delta S of the universe is going to be positive. But this second law of thermodynamics is important. Um, some factors affecting entropy here, and this is not an exhaustive list, just some of the more common ones you'll need to understand for organic chemistry. Um, so it turns out entropy is greater for gases as compared to liquids or solids. So for a gas, the molecules are moving much faster and they are much more spread out. And with that big increase in volume, there's a huge increase in entropy uh, as for gases compared to solids or liquids, significantly more. Uh, the second thing that's important here is entropy is greater when you have more molecules. So if you have more moles or more molecules all in the same phase, you've got more entropy. So, and then finally, entropy is going to be greater with more complex molecules, an increase in complexity. That means more atoms, more types of atoms, uh, those sorts of things. That'll lead to greater entropy in that molecule. So, this second one really, again, is going to be an important one. When you've got more molecules, assuming all your reactants and products are in the same phase, whichever side, the reactant side or product side, has more molecules would be the one with greater entropy. So if you, you have two molecules turning into one, that would have a negative delta S for that reaction. Or if you have one molecule turning into two, that would result in a positive delta S for that reaction. And that's probably the most common factor uh, we'll see for all of organic chemistry. Again, this is not an exhaustive list. There are many other factors that affect entropy, just none that are really important to the discussion here for organic reactions. So now that we've talked about both enthalpy and entropy, finally here we've got to talk about Gibbs free energy symbolized with the letter G here. And they call it Gibbs free energy. Uh, and free here, you should think of like the word available. Like, are you free on Friday night for dinner? Are you available on Friday night for dinner? And in this case, Gibbs free energy is the energy that is available to do work. That's its definition. So, and the idea here, the big point you want to get across is that when the delta G of a reaction is negative, that reaction is spontaneous, and the word we use for it is exergonic. And that might be a new word. Not all the time do we explain that to our students in Gen Chem, um, but same diff. Delta G negative, that's a spontaneous reaction. It will happen, uh, and it's exergonic. On the other hand, if delta G is positive, that reaction is not spontaneous. So it's not spontaneous in the forward direction. It turns out to be spontaneous in the reverse direction, but not in the forward. And we refer to that as being endergonic. So again, another word we might not have introduced to you in general chemistry. So a big thing here is by the just looking at the sign of delta G, you know whether a reaction is spontaneous or non-spontaneous. So now let's put this all together and compare delta G to delta H to delta S. So and oftentimes you'll hear people say that you need to get higher test scores, whatever, but you do need to know this equation and, and very especially understand it. This is the relationship between delta G, delta H, and delta S gives free energy, change in enthalpy, change in entropy. So, and essentially we want to look at the requirements it takes to get a reaction to be spontaneous. And again, for a spontaneous reaction, delta G's got to come out negative. Now we're going to kind of look at this as just the sum of two terms. And the first term here to get delta G is delta H. The second term here is going to be the comp composite here of negative T delta S. Now the temperature here is measured in Kelvin, and there's no such thing as a negative temperature in Kelvin, so that cannot be a negative number. And so what you see here is that whatever sign you give to delta S, because of this negative sign, this whole second term, negative T delta S, will have the opposite sign as delta S alone. So let's see how this kind of works. So if we look at this first situation here, so that's situation number one. So delta H is negative, so the first term is negative. And delta S is positive, which means that negative T delta S, the whole thing, is also going to come out negative. And so in this case, when you have two negative numbers, simply adding them together, 
means you have to come out with a negative number. And the key here is the second term has temperature in it. And so at really high temperatures, the second term's a really big magnitude. So, but at low temperature, it'd be a really small magnitude. Whether it's a big negative or a small negative, I don't care. Adding two negative numbers, this reaction is going to come out spontaneous no matter what temperature you plug in. And that's why we say it's spontaneous at all temperatures. Now, if we look at a situation number two here, so we're going to do the exact opposite. So situation number two, we're going to have a positive delta H, so the first term is positive, and a negative delta S. And a negative times a negative delta S means the second term here, negative T delta S, is going to come out positive as well. And with both terms being positive, when you add them together, you can't help but come out with a delta G that comes out positive, regardless of temperature. And so we say that this reaction is going to be non-spontaneous at all temperatures. So the other way we could word that is just say that the reverse reaction would be spontaneous at all temperatures. So finally, in these last two, we've got a temperature dependence. When delta H and delta S have the same sign, we'll see a temperature dependence. Like when delta H and delta S are both negative, that's situation number three. So delta H is negative, and if delta S is negative, then negative T delta S, the entire term comes out positive. Now, if I want delta G to come out negative, then I want to minimize that second term that's being positive, and that's the one I can affect with temperature. And if I want to minimize it, then I want to carry out this reaction at low temperatures. That way, this comes out to be a low positive number, and the negative term will dominate. And so we say this reaction will be spontaneous at low temperatures, as long as the temperature is low enough. So finally, in our fourth situation here, so with delta H and delta S both being positive, so delta H is positive, endothermic reaction, and with delta S being positive, this whole second term is going to come out negative. So, and now it's this second term, the one that I actually want to dominate, a negative term. And so in this case, I want this to actually be as large a temperature as possible. That way this becomes as big a negative number as possible and is bigger in magnitude than our positive delta H term. And that way delta G comes out negative. And so we say this reaction is spontaneous at high temperatures. So in this case, just high enough to where the second term here dominates, and delta G comes out negative. So this should hopefully be a little bit of review from Gen Chem. I just want to review it one more time. So big picture here is if you again, you look at really this first column here. So the universe wants uh, chemical species to be lower in energy. That means a negative delta H. And it wants increased randomness, increased disorder in the system as well. And that's a positive delta S. And if you give the universe both of those things at once, it'll be, a reaction will be spontaneous at all temperatures. But at the very least, you've got to give the universe at least one of the things it wants. Either give it an exothermic reaction to lower the energy of the reactants as they turn into products, or give it an increase in disorder. If you give it one of the two, it'll be spontaneous at least some of the time. But if you don't give it either of those two, and that's what we had in the second scenario, so then the reaction will be non-spontaneous at any temperature. So now we want to take a couple minutes out and look at the relationship between Gibbs free energy and the equilibrium constant. Recall the equilibrium constant is kind of the ratio of products to reactants when a reaction reaches equilibrium. So and it turns out there's a relationship between the standard delta G value and the equilibrium constant K. Now standard here means that all aqueous species are at a one molar concentration or all gaseous species are at a one atmosphere partial pressure. So but all reactants and products are, have a concentration of one, one way or the other. Uh, and in this case, for a reaction under those conditions, if the delta G standard is negative, that means it's spontaneous under standard conditions, then you're going to end up with more products and your equilibrium constant is bigger than one. So whereas if your delta G standard is positive, means it's not spontaneous under the conditions, a reverse reaction spontaneous under standard conditions, then you'll end up with more reactants and your equilibrium constant will be less than one. So if we kind of look at this mathematically here, so in this case we can kind of look at it backwards. So in the first example, so KEQ is greater than one, and when you take the natural log of a number bigger than one, you end up with a positive number. And a negative times a positive R, a positive T, and a positive L and K would get you a negative delta G standard. So vice versa, if you have a KEQ that is less than one, turns out when you take that natural log of a number less than one, you get a negative number, and a negative times a negative would get you a positive value for delta G standard. So that's kind of the relationship there. You should just understand that, you know, if a reaction is spontaneous under standard conditions, that reaction will favor the products at equilibrium and get you a KEQ value, an equilibrium constant that's greater than one, and then vice versa.